Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Ryan Lizza. I'm the Washington correspondent for The New Yorker. Um, we're very lucky to have with us today Congressman Rahm Emanuel. Um, the few good reasons to have him to here today to talk politics. Um, he wears a lot of hats. He is um, not just a congressman who was elected in 2002. Uh, that would be reason enough to have him. He's not just one of the chief strategists for the, for the Democrats in Washington. That would be reason enough. Um, He's also a member, member of the House uh, Democratic uh, leadership team, number four in the House. Um, he's also the man, I think, most responsible in 2006 for the Democrats taking back the House uh, when the Democrats won 30 seats. Um, but he is also um, one of the rarest politicians in America and one of the most coveted politicians in America because he is an undeclared superdelegate. <laughs> um, there's only, I counted today, there's only 217 of you guys left. It's an exclusive club. A very exclusive club. <laughs> and I also th think you have the distinction of being, I, th I think there are people that know the Obamas better than Rom does. There are probably people that know the Clintons better than Rom does. But I don't think there's anyone in American politics that knows both the Clintons and the Obamas as well as Rom does. Uh, being a congressman from... Which is why I'm hiding under my desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want, I want to play uh, Russert for a second and read you a quote. The quote to the New York Times recently was, um, the way the loser loses this primary will determine whether the winner wins in November, you said. So let me ask you, hasn't Hillary Clinton lost this race? <laughs> well, um... Next question. Uh, <laughs> question number, yeah, President Clinton, anytime there was a two-part question, President Clinton used to say, let me answer the second question first, the first question second. Was, he didn't want to handle the first question. Yeah. Look, yeah. I think we have a presumptive nominee. Yeah. How, what Hillary does in the next month, uh, I think, is, import, is important. And I know everybody, you know, when's it going to end? When's it, everybody wants the end of the movie before they go show, see the movie. If she spends her time contrasting with Senator McCain, drawing distinctions that help the Democratic Party, that's productive. Yeah. If it's done in another way, that's not productive. Uh, I do think, and the reason I made that comment, if you look at history, when Ted Kennedy in 1980 continued, basically, you know, grabbed Jimmy Carter's hand and said he's the winner, walked off stage and allowed the primary to continue past the primary, or Reagan in 76 to, uh, to Ford, allowed that primary to really go on past the primary, that event, or the fact that there was not a single event that clo had closure and then allowed uh, the nominee to basically take on the general election, affected the ability of both Ford and Carter to move on in their respective campaigns. And so I do believe, given that how long this has lasted and what's happened, that in many ways, everybody will want to focus on the general election candidate, our nominee and the general election that the loser and how they lose will have a big influence on whether the winner can actually go on and take on the general election and get ready for that process. Knowing the Clintons, and you probably know Bill better than Hillary, what, who are the people around her that she listens to, and how do you think she's going to make this decision? Who, who are the most influential people in her orbit? Well, first, I mean... It, this is the most kind of analyzed relation. I used to say when I left the White House after, uh, after the Lewinsky scandal, I left in 98, I'm going to go fo focus on my personal life now. I spent two years on somebody else's, I want mine back. Uh, the most, uh, they've been the most, look, the two most important, the most important person in uh, President Clinton's, I hope that's not an editorial. <laughs> uh, or maybe that's Clinton carrying dishes. Uh, 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 the most important thing, uh, to uh, Senator Clinton and Hillary is uh, Bill Clinton's advice. And that's also true about uh, the president. And so she will listen to that and, uh, and take, I mean, what she'll do is, and my guess is what's happening, is there's a series of phone calls going on, people offering advice, being synthesized. I think that uh, how she, uh, and she's going to calculate, uh, you know, how she wants to continue at this process. Um, and where uh, does she have an opportunity? I don't think at this point to be just taking a look at the facts you have. Yeah. And I do want to make one thing about facts. Um, uh, those are a stubborn thing. No, here's the thing is, at this point, Barack is the presumptive nominee. At this point. You're, uh, Let me just finish this thing. 
Hillary can't win, but something could happen that could affect that Brock could lose the nomination. That's really where you are at this point. And but, both in this at this point, Barack has kind of a... But doesn't uh, that mean that all of her incentives are to create that something that could make him lose? In other words, you said a lot of, a lot of, a lot about, a lot of what, what history will record as far as how she moves forward is the way she does it, the tone she takes. Right. But doesn't she have to basically destroy, burn the village in order to save it here? I mean, how else can she... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask how else does she? <laughs> how else does she win? No, look, how you write the po how you end it will write the postscript of her campaign, yeah. and that's essential for her. And she has a, she's you know young enough; she has a big career ahead of her in the Senate or wherever else she chooses to go. And how you I mean, as much as her ending it will deter what, how the loser ends it will determine the winner. How that story gets written yeah. will determine not just the winner's capacity to go on, but what happens to the, the person who didn't get the nomination and what they want to do in their lives. Yeah, yeah, and her future. And what do you think, what do you think her future is after this campaign? Majority, well, people talk about majority. Well, let me just say, you know, this, she can do, this is an incredible person with incredible resources, capacity. Yeah. I mean, just take a look at it. She's gone through, as everybody says, oh, when she's going to leave. She's gone through Ken Starr. She's gone through her marriage being ridiculed. She's gone through being blamed for health care, and, and she is still going and building. So, I mean, this is not, when she says, I'm not a quitter, I'm not a fighter, I'm a fighter, that is an accurate depiction of who she is at a, cred at a facing incredible, you know, things to stop her, speed bumps in the way of that process and adversity. Yeah. And so you've got to take stock of that. And so, you know, you look at this today, and she, you say, well, she didn't make this presidency, but she has, a, a, you know, she has a number of things available to her that she can choose to do, and I would never, I mean, if history tells you one thing, don't ever count the Clinton out. Let me yeah. though say one thing about, I think, what's illustrative um, of uh, this presidential primary. Everything we know, the only thing that you've learned out of this process is what's predictable is the unpredictable. The, how, who won Iowa was determinative of what would happen. Wrong. We'll have a nominee before they have a nominee. Wrong. February 5th will determine who the nominee is. Wrong. I mean, I know you're now wondering why you have me up here, since I've been wrong on every prediction. Uh, <laughs> to, but everything you know. So what does that mean to going forward? If you look at all historical data available, economy, personal income, war, eight years in one party, the recession, etc., it all would point Democrat. I would, you know, choosing to, if you had to be a better, I would say, uh, you know, I'd rather be us than them. But the one thing we now know from the last seven months, even I'll go to the other side, John McCain was not supposed to be their nominee. What you predicted would happen, the only thing you now know, is it didn't happen. So all indicators, I'd rather be us, I feel good about this election for us, but you do now know the fact is that what you thought was going to happen did not happen, which is why I think the next five months are going to be, you know, not, nobody should roll, you know, assume that these guys are going to roll over and let you scratch their belly. Yeah. They are going to yeah. try to cling to power, and like in 06, you've got to go take it from them. They don't give up power easily. Well, let me ask you a question on that subject then. This should be a gimme for the Democrats, <laughs> right? 70% disapproval for Bush, overwhelming majority. 82. 82? In the, no. Okay. Not that, I'm <laughs> Not that you're uh, they, checking it, this it, stuff. It, it, it's 70. It's in the uh, high 70s. Overwhelming majority of the public is, uh, believes we're on the wrong track. Um, McCain's key issue is the war. The, the, the country has turned against that. Um, the Democrats should be able to elect anyone and win this election. And yet, when we look at these polls, when we look at these head-to-head -head polls between McCain yeah. and Hillary or McCain and Obama, we see a tie race. Yeah. So, can the Demo is there a way for the Democrats to blow this election? I think the answer is in the question. Uh, no, it goes back to what I said, in yeah. the sense that the unpredictable is the most reliable factor. Yeah. Could you, would, given the available data, I would, as I get back to, yeah. politics is very dynamic. I'd rather be us than them. Yeah. What you have is two nominees who totally alter and shake up traditional coalitions in the parties. The only reason, look, John McCain is running 18 points ahead of generic Republican performance. Why? Because John McCain's not a Republican. At perceptive level, I think he's an unbelievably hardcore right-wing Republican. Our job is to show 
who he really is. But do you think but the McCain no, no. brand is intact, and that, that, that independent brand, he still maintains no, it, that? Nothing's intact in politics. Yeah. But at the moment, he's... Right now it is, but nothing's yeah. intact in politics. And it's... But look, and then Barack also fundamentally alters what you assume are the coalitions that go on. You know, we've had How two so? special elections, okay? Two special elections, one in Louisiana, one right next door in my suburban area. Not in the Louisiana race in Baton Rouge. They hadn't had a Democrat since 74. Outside of one two-year term, the district where former Speaker Denny Hastert comes from in my backyard, hadn't had a Democrat in 76 years outside of one term. So there's an exurb district and a, rural, and a southern district. Two Democrats won. The Republicans ran on taxes in Republican districts, and their ace for the last 30 years came up joker. Now, what does that tell you about politics? That people want change. What traditionally plays and works may not this cycle. And you have two candidates who are stealing voters from the other side. And I don't think the deck has quite shuffled its way out yet. Yeah. And that will happen July -ish, uh, August. But don't think that you, what you think you know about politics is slightly fundamentally different. Let me ask you, let's... let's talk about the, the future a little bit. Let's talk about Obama. <laughs> Let's, we were talking about this upstairs. We are at a future conference. We are at the future conference. the future conference. Let's skip ahead to an Obama administration with a Democratic Congress, which if you're just looking at the polls, which we probably shouldn't trust, is the most likely outcome this year. I feel more confident about that. We're already in that too. <laughs> okay. What does the first hundred days of, uh, of, of Democrats in charge of Washington for the first time since 1994, mm -hmm. um, what does that look like? Look, and look, you're, you're going to be in the leadership position. You're going to be well, working with the White House here. What, it, that what gets passed? The, well, we've had this you were on the other side of the aisle in 93. You were in the White right. House with the Democratic Congress. So the, the, After two years, that majority, the Democratic majority the first, was gone. Well, they, assuming you have a Democrat, we're working on this presumption. I happen to think it's also true, at least on the first three weeks. Assuming that you have a Democratic House, Democratic Senate, yeah. and a wh Democratic White House, the first three weeks, a children's health care bill for 10 million children gets signed into law. I could, I could argue also the first six months are dealing with George Bush's bitter, the season of his vetoes, which is what I would describe the last six months of his presidency, which is, Wait, which is totally weird to me based on historical precedent. That, so the first thing, you get a kid's health care bill. But I, wait, I already see a conflict between the Democrats in the House and Barack Obama. Barack Obama's health plan is a comprehensive health plan. It's not just kids. So you guys are going to push something no, that's, no, no. It, right? You asked me what's going to happen in the first 100 days. You didn't ask me what's going to happen in the first 100 years of the Iraq war for John McCain. Uh, so, uh, you asked me about, what's that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you asked me about the first 100 days. Okay. okay? Uh, assuming, I, and I also say this, and I want to, whether that's Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton, that bill will be on their desk. Both are for it. We were this close, five votes short of a veto over, ten votes short of a veto override in the uh, House. We had enough for a veto override in the Senate. And you want to show you can get something done. You want to show you have been changed. Remember, when everybody talks about change, it's not just change in Washington. The reference point to change is George Bush. It's not some amorphous intellectual Harvard dissertation change. It is reference to that guy who is at the lowest polling of any president in modern history for the longest period of time. And he earned every one of those numbers. Okay? <laughs> The change is to him. His veto for the kids' health care bill, and you get it done in the first three weeks, is change. The next piece would be other pieces if he decides which... So you don't do health care the way you guys tried no, to do it in 93? No. You, you would then, that doesn't prohibit a universal package being presented, which I still believe gets done. But you, what you will have then is also, um, and we discussed this, I think also will be introduced, and uh, it will drive a lot of the first term or the first half, of the first half of the first term. In 2009, 29 million Americans will be bumped up to the AMT, the alternative minimum tax. In 2010, George Bush's tax cuts unwind themselves. They expire. That is a critical storm, of a perfect storm, of a major tax reform not seen since 1986. 
Barack has run on, as well as Hillary, although they have slightly different, major middle class tax cuts and tax reform. And Democrats will, going into a midterm election, both the policy and the conditions of the law will facilitate that. Plus, you'll want to take something into the midterm elections that you've gotten. But done. I can already see the argument from the other side, which is first 100 days in a Democratic, Democratic run Washington is going to be a big new health care plan, government takeover of health care, as Republicans will call it, and a tax increase. This, I mean, to, it looks a little bit Fine. like 93 all over again. And one of the debates you guys had in the White House was whether to do welfare reform first to sort of establish Clinton's no. sort of centrist credentials and then do health care rather than do health care first. I'm reminded at this point in the interview, Henry Kissinger once said, do you have any questions for my answers? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> let, me, let, let me go. Actually, that's not, that's not true. Let, there's, a, there's a misnomer in history, if I could. Yeah, sure. The big debate in the White House was not welfare or health care. Yeah. The big debate was early on was you do health care and the budget together because passing the budget requires 50 votes. Passing a health care bill requires 60. That's all in the Senate. The bird rule. Yes. Yeah. And the big debate was whether you do them together or you do them as separate. Yeah. That was the biggest decision. And if you look back at everything, whether individual mandate, employer mandate, etc., that critical decision to try to split them was a critical decision, I think, that any next Democratic president with a Democratic House and Senate would have to decide. Can I say one thing sure, of sure. historical? What is the, this is about the longest I've ever sat still, and I know you're wondering if I'm actually doing that. <laughs> Truman, Johnson, Nixon, Carter, and Clinton all tried universal health care. We're in four out, every time it was tried was with the Democratic House and Senate, four of the times tried with Democratic presidents, and we're zero for five. Every president who's tried universal then has backed up to universalizing health care for a population. Johnson went long, ended up with Medicare and Medicaid. We then got veterans, and then we got kids' health care in 97 after the universal failed in 94. Health, our government has succeeded at universalizing health care for population, not the population. That is the history of health care reform in our country. A president and a Democrat will go universal, should go universal. The difference between now and then is business finally has gotten into the driver's seat and said, we're for it. Every time in the other five junctures, they kind of got in the seat and they got right out of the car right when it was pulling out of the parking lot. Okay? That's the difference. And a president, he or she will have to decide, do I do health care reform with tax reform because of the way the tax code, I think, wrongly incentivizes some parts of health care? Or not wrongly, does incentivize some in mismatches in the market on health care? Or do I do them separate? And if I do them separate, do I go long and then have something in the drawer that's more targeted, like small business reform, that gives, univer that gives a health care to univer uh, universal to small business? That's the critical junctures. It wasn't, and no disrespect to the reading of history, and you, you have read what's been written, the most critical junk decision in the presidency wasn't welfare, welfare although I ran it for the president to get it done and believe it was the right thing to do, wasn't welfare versus health care. Yeah. It was doing health care and the budget together or not. And that was a critical decision that was within the first 100 days. You can do health care and taxes together. And that decision will have to be made by uh, both the uh, president and Congress, given the historical opportunities we have to do something big both in health care and in tax reform. Let's take a step back. One of the differences... I thought that's what we were doing. One of the differences between um, this, this election and, and, and 92 um, is... In, in 92, there really was, were big ideological debates among the Democrats and in the campaign. One of the narratives of this campaign has been that the ideological differences between Hillary and Obama have been kind of small. But there has been this one big debate over globalization. And you've said that the party that figures out globalization will be the majority party for the next few decades. Um, it seems that all Democrats talk about when they talk about globalization is, is NAFTA. You were the point man on NAFTA when you were in the White House. Did you ever expect that Democrats would still be debating this issue now? And what... And, what, 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 do Democrats, what do you have in mind for Democrats to sort of uh, control the issue of globalization? Well, look, I think that the trade is really a metaphor for a bigger discussion about globalization. We never have a discussion about globalization. I mean, I'm, the folks in this room do, but this country doesn't. You know, you can't, you know, trade is always a misnomer 
when you go and ask people, I mean, I'm weird. I do my office hours at grocery stores. I don't go do town halls. I'm people walking in who are buying groceries. I just sat there. I do a desk, two people there doing casework, and I just shake people's hands, 180 in an hour and a half. Just random. Trade is never about trade. It's not about the rules of the road with Colombia or Mexico. It's about people's health care. It's about people's retirement and the lack of security. It's about the lack, the fact that their incomes have gone down, and the next job they got is probably less in pay than now. It's about their edu educational capacity for their children, and they think even for them. That's what globalization is. And trade, when they say, "Oh, we got to have free trade," okay, I'll, I'm willing to have a trade. I'm willing to have a discussion about trade if you're willing to have a discussion about globalization. I'm about the last thing you'll ever find in the Democratic Party. I am for trade. I ran NAFTA for Clinton. I ran GATT for Clinton to get it through the Congress. I voted for Peru. But we never have a full conversation in this country about what has happened to the standard of living in the middle class. Trade, globalization, is seen as a lost series of opportunities to people in my district. I represent the bungalow belt of Chicago. It's seen as a threat, not as an opportunity. Globalization for everybody in this room, I'll put dollars for donuts, is an opportunity. But you go represent people. My district used to be Dan Rostokowski, Frank Anunzio, Roman Paczynski, Rob Blagojevich, which is why you wonder why they elected a guy called Ram Israel Emanuel. Not exactly in that lineage. <laughs> okay? But to the people working in my district, they think of it as less, not more. They think it is as a cost, not an opportunity. They think it is a problem for their kids. And until we, and if we, Democrats, figure out that answer, George Bush offered them the ownership society, and it fell flat on its face. What he never gave them is with anything you own is a guarantee, and it comes with a warranty. He never gave them that. Our job is to give people that warranty. Right. What is a universal retirement? I know we're out of time, and I'll shut up here. I got it. <laughs> you got to get, give people that opportunity. You got to give people that chance that they can succeed. You do that, global state, we won't have this discussion. But the American people are going to pull a halt, which is what they've done through the political system, on the discussion of trade and trade deals until they've gotten an opportunity to have an, a say on globalization. And it's not an accident that the big issue in the Democratic Party is trade, and the big issue in the Republican Party is immigration. Two representatives, one cultural, one economic, of the differences in people's world. That's the future, and whoever owns that will own the political future of this country. Right. And on that note, we'll finish up. Thanks a lot, Ron. Really appreciate it. That was excellent, buddy.